In the near future on planet Earth, many kinds of creatures once it coexisted on this verdant planet. But, after countless wars and untold environmental destruction, the planet plunged into an ice age. Humanity was left with no choice but to migrate en masse underground. When the Ice Age finally came to an end, humans began developing methods while they were living underground to one day restore their planet to the lush green landscape it once was. During this time, a large, mysterious comet fell to the Earth. However, the progress of restoring their lost ecosystem was coming along well, and humanity was eventually able to live on the surface again. Several hundred years have passed since then. Enter a young man named Jason Frudnik, known for being a genius in the field of robotic engineering. One day, he came upon a creature he had never seen before. No records of this creature existed. With his interest in this mysterious creature piqued, Jason named it Fred and began to observe it closely. But after some time had passed, Fred escaped. Jason gave chase, and he observed Fred jump into a mysterious hole that appeared seemingly out of nowhere. He was rather astonished by the phenomenon he witnessed, but Jason followed Fred down the same hole. He eventually found himself in a cave deep underground. That's where he discovered a large vehicle. Almost as if this vehicle with the name Sophia 3 on the side was inviting him in, the door to the cockpit opened up. In order to bring Fred back, Jason hopped into Sophia 3 and set out on his adventure. Little did he know, the strange phenomena were only... just getting started. That's a good title theme. Hello everyone and welcome to Let's Play Blaster Master Zero. I've been wanting to do this one more or less since it got released, but ever since the PC version became a thing. That's uh, a lot easier for me to record than a Switch or a 3DS. Either way, uh, that, 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 that plot dump was definitely much more informative than anything in the original game. So what do you say we just get right into it, start up a new game once I press the game start button. I'm going to be playing on normal mode because the higher difficulties aren't unlocked yet on this file. Is this one of those underground forest areas they made during the last ice age? Hundreds of years have passed, but the ecosystem's alive and well. It would seem that the preservation system's still functioning somehow. Better still keep my guard up, never know what could still be here. Starting up like the original game, we are immediately in the Sophia tank, and it controls more or less the same, just more fluidly than the original game. Jump with the, I think it's the B button, shoot with the Y button. Unlike the original Blaster Master, which you use the select button to get out of the tank, you now use the Y button, you'll actually see me still press select a few times early on because I guess for some reason I thought I was playing the original one, despite having played this game a couple times on my own time anyway. A new control, though, is that if you press the R button, you can now immediately put your tank into a diagonal aim. Uh, it's sort of like the main uh, GBA Metro games in that regard, actually. Fred's signal was definitely being transmitted from the forest area. Receiver is being displayed on the monitor. I guess I'm pretty lucky that Sophia has a functionality like this. With the receiver, I'm able to get a general idea of where Fred is. I can't help but wonder how Sophia could track his signal, though. Then again, I don't really know how anything in this machine works yet. 
Uh, that is something you can enable in the pause menu. If you press pause at the start button, you can just go down to the, I think it's the bottom right, and turn on the receiver. Which will basically add a bit of a compass functionality to your top right of the screen, which just gets, uh, it starts blue, turns yellow, and then gets red when you're close to where you need to go for plot. I'll turn that on later on. I'm going through area one more or less how I go through it myself, just for the sake of consistency, I guess. When you get out of the Sophia, though, you're left as Jason himself, and then you eventually enter uh, top-down sections like this, which control... The closest thing I can compare them to, in a way, is the top-down sections in Contra 3. You move with the D-pad or analog stick. I usually use the analog stick, uh, the D-pad, rather, unless necessary. And you press the B button to shoot the A button to use your sub-weapons, which are the yellow things up near my bar. You have limited ammo for your sub-weapons, so make sure you watch out, though, with that. I'm namely coming into this place for one reason, and that is this particular green item here. This is an area map. The moment you get this, the entire area you're in's map is available to you, showing anything where there might be a little sub-dungeon where we can get power-ups, uh, where the health power-ups in the area are, as well as exits er, and entrances into other areas. It also gives you the map for any little sub-dungeons like this. Now, the main thing you saw me do earlier is the main sub-weapon you have to start as a standard grenade. That can destroy certain portions of wall. And that allowed us to get a little pink uh, power up there. That powers up the main blaster rifle that Jason's using when he's out of the tank. Uh, there are, I think, ten levels technically for the blaster. Zero through ten. Uh, for each level, it has a different effect. However, unlike the original game, you can press and hold the L button, or just spam the left button, uh, the L button in general, to swap between whichever level you want to use. Uh, because in the original game, you were just locked to whichever one you were on, I believe, unless there's a mechanic I'm completely forgetting about, which is entirely possible. By pressing the A button, you actually are allowed to use your sub up, which uses the special meter on the top left. That can be recovered with either the blue items or just by waiting a bit. The first one we got is a triple missile. It fires three missiles forward that will pierce terrain. I think they're constantly going out at an angle, though, so you need to be very careful about aiming unless you want to be right in front of an enemy. I am deliberately ignoring the plot area for right now, though, because I want to get everything I can along the way. And that involves entering this dungeon as well. More or less, anything you see that looks like a rock can be destroyed in any of the given areas of the game, so that's more or less just going to be your big secret to progression. You also just want to do that because very often they'll contain any of the power-ups, which is usually just the pink ones for your weapon, the green ones for your health, or the yellow ones, which are just your sub-weapon ammunition. Notable, though, with your weapon levels. Uh, if you take a hit, you're immediately brought down to the previous level. Uh, there is a way to sort of mitigate this later on, but for right now, it's generally going to be the thing that happens. That there is a checkpoint. It acts as a save point if you die to a boss fight. Speaking of which, we're about to get into our first boss fight. That's just a good siren sound effect. The boss here is just a spam of these Vols enemies in their various forms. Certain enemies have multiple variations that change in color, and especially these guys. Uh, more or less, different colors have different HP amounts. Uh, notable though, this is actually the only type of this boss fight I'm going to show at normal speed. Essentially, several of these side areas of the game, if they don't have a proper, unique boss fight, they just have a mook rush of sorts. And I'm going to be fast-forwarding all mook rushes from here on just because they're not as interesting. It's just me taking out the same enemy type over and over and over and over again. With that, though, let's talk about the Buster Rifle and its various levels, so to speak. To start off, it's just a standard blaster. Short range, low firepower. I think you only have two screens on three, uh, two shots on screen at a time, rather. At level one, you get the long range. It's like the long beam from Metroid 1 and... Zero mission. Yeah, you, you fire across the screen. I think you get an additional shot on screen at a time. And I think it's also twice as powerful. Level two is the penetrator. Uh, that allows shot... That, that has a slower fire rate, two on screen at a time. But its shots will pierce terrain, walls, and even enemies uh, fire into one another. I think it's about the same strength as the long range, though. After that is the diffusion, which is a short range kind of spread shot from Contra. Uh, you fire them in a bit of an angle... From a distance, it's not too strong. It's about the strength of the long range, I'd say. But up close, it's super strong. And for beating this boss, we get the Thunderbreaker, a weapon that shoots lightning directly out of Sophia. Hmm. 
Looks like this chip can restore one of Sophia's functions. The data analyzed by that chip is being displayed inside my helmet. I get the feeling there are more ships like this out there. It makes me wonder just who in the world made all this tech. Man, I'd love to dig into all this, but I gotta focus on finding Fred. The lightning sub weapon, the Thunder Breaker, isn't the most useful. You fire lightning directly out of the bottom of the tank. With that said, it does have a pretty useful uh, secondary functionality underwater. You gain two more little Thunder Breaker uh, projectiles, and it'll also basically just electric electrify anything beneath you in the general area, as shown right here. That is surprisingly useful in a later world. Either way, while I head to my next destination, uh, continuing on, the fourth level of the blaster is the Auto Blaster, where you fire a continuous string of bullets, however, the longer you hold the button, uh, the spread becomes more erratic. I think it's technically weaker per shot compared to the standard blaster. By the way, that's the full map of this area. We'll be exploring a lot of that throughout the game, just for area one alone. But it, it makes up for it. The auto makes up for it just by if you're being right in front of an enemy, you're getting a lot of shots in really quick. Level five's an odd one. It's a reflector shield. It, the, it, it deflects enemy bullets. Uh, it's got a hidden mechanic, though, in that if you time your reflection perfectly to, like, the shot hitting you, it does a lot more damage. About equivalent, I believe, to uh, the diffusion spread gun, like, if you're right in front of something. Level 6 is also pretty interesting. It's the Striker, I think is what it's called. It's a lightning ball is what it is to me. Uh, what that does, it fires a very slow projectile forward that's uh, about maybe three or four times stronger than the blaster ability, I think. But if you hit an enemy with it, and there's another, another enemy within a short range, it'll hit them as well through a bit of a lightning spread. Getting that is pretty, pro pretty good for late game, just because there's so many enemies in close proximity. Level 7 is one I don't tend to use too much, but it has its uses as well. It's the flame one, uh, where you hold the fire button to use a flamethrower. You walk slower when you're using it. Uh, you can set enemies on fire for some lingering damage. It can melt certain things. I think each individual flame is slightly weaker than the blaster's starting power, but its overall lingering damage makes it stronger. And here, the one you're going to see me using a lot is level 8, the wave beam. You fire a very powerful beam that will pierce enemies and walls. And it shots about as strong as the blaster, but because of its much higher firing rate, essentially, I think, I, wanna say, I don't want to say it's infinite, but it's a lot higher. You're going to be doing a lot with it. And an important thing to note that you just saw me do there, I think if either you attack an enemy right as they're about to attack, or hit them with more than one hit at once, you can stun an enemy for a short time. The wave beam is very good at doing this, which is why I think it's actually hitting them with two shots at a time, if it's not just a pure counterattack. The sequel would kind of use these mechanics a lot better to its advantage, but for right now, we got ourselves a good deal. And now it's time for the boss of the first area. What the hell is that? Some giant mutant? Damn it, I guess I gotta do this. Boss of area one is the force destroyer, Mother Brain. Metroid joke here. This boss isn't too bad though. It tends to stay rather immobile. It'll open up its brain to shoot out a few projectiles at you, but if you just spam fire the wave beam, if you have it, you can just take care of the projectiles it's trying to shoot at you all once, in which case it'll then move to a different location and then do that same thing again. I do believe it's invincible during certain phases of its movement, but otherwise it's a very easy boss if you have max weapon. And our reward for that is this. The Hyper Shot. This powers up Sophia's main weapon. You can now defeat some enemies that you previously couldn't. Also notable, uh, all future load times like that are going to be cut out from future parts. The only one that's going to be kept in is the beginning of area load time, just for the sake of it. Looks like Fred's signal isn't coming from the forest area anymore. Let's see. It looks like it's coming from some kind of residential area. That's actually pretty close by. Okay, let's get this show on the road. We're not quite done here in Area 1 yet, though. There are two more items we can grab, which is namely one dungeon and one uh, health pickup, because every area has those things exactly. And it's marked on the map. That little weird evil face is the next dungeon that has a boss fight for us to fight. And the other one is just the health pickup. That little circle there on the top right is the receiver. I'm more or less going to have that on for the rest of the game. Just because 
I like to have it. Even though it's... Blaster Master Zero is not a hard game to get lost in. Or rather, wait. Did I, did I say that right? I think it's a... It's not an easy game to get lost in, I think is what I mean to say. You're not going to get lost too often. Between the story's guidance of telling you where to go, and the overall more linear structure, I feel, compared to the original game, uh, it's going to be hard to get lost in. Unless you're going for 100%. Even then, uh, just due to how much better this game controls, I feel you're going to have an easier time if you had trouble with the original Blaster Master. Because the original one, it's good, but it uh, it has some difficulties. Especially because that game had limited continues, this one has infinite saves. And this is the life up. It does what you'd think it said. Uh, it increases the life of both Sophia and Jason by one point each. From that, you can postulate that there's, just based off our life bar, eight health ups in the game. And that's right, because there's eight main areas. For the most part, you're going to see me try and just blast through, uh, pun unintentional there, surprisingly, uh, a lot of the levels in this game, just because the areas themselves aren't too interesting. Most of them just have the same, uh, just have a slight gimmick change. Whereas the overhead sections like this, the thing that tends to change more often than anything beyond the boss fights is the enemies you fight in them themselves. There's seldom, a, well, a more, more so than the original, at least, there are gimmicks to the overhead sections, but a lot of them are going to be more or less the same thing over and over again. And now it's time for the boss of this. This is the Draft Trappers. There are going to be three of the Trapper enemies, the weird little spheroid things we saw earlier coming from the holes in the wall. A green one, an orange one, and then a kind of bluish red one. They're going to place mines on the floor, and when the bluish-red one gets to the center, it's going to detonate all of them in very quick succession. So what you need to do is either destroy some of the mines along the way, or just try and stay out of their general vicinity. Given that they have a relatively small blast radius, that's not easy, that's not hard to do, rather. But if you're not paying attention or you're being extraordinarily reckless, this boss can cause some trouble, I guess. The diffusion's really good here, I know that for a fact. You're also going to see me using grenades a lot throughout the game, just because, especially if you partner them with stunned, or it's very easy to get a lot of damage very quickly with them. Though, th thankfully, the grenade glitch from the original game is no longer here, so we can't just cheese half the boss fights in the game. Though, I guess to some people, that's quite the sad thing, isn't it? And you know what? I get it. I like, I like glitching games. I like doing stupid stuff. I do the pause glitch every time I play Mega Man 1 just because I hate the Yellow Devil that much. And the boss rush, now that I think about it. And for beating this dungeon, we get the Ignition Bomb, a sub-weapon that sets a bomb that can be triggered by pressing the sub-weapon button again. Looks like this chip lets me use a new sub-weapon. Gotta figure out how to read my surroundings and use the best weapons for the situation at hand. It's a trigger mine, just straight up. I don't think enemies can trigger by walking into it, but honestly, I so seldom use this particular weapon, I'm honestly not sure. I think it doesn't. Uh, actually, wait, no, now that I think about it, no, there's one boss I almost always use it on, and it never activates when they step on it. So yeah, it's entirely up to you when to use them. Honestly, out of all the sub-weapons, it's probably my least favorite, because even the one that is technically less useful has a dedicated use to it that the trigger mine doesn't. But with that, I'm going to need to end this off here. This LP is more or less going to be one area per part. Thank you guys for watching, and in part two, we're heading into area two. See you guys then.